Hello. And how are we doing this evening, guys? So, yeah, this is my first live stream. Um, I think I'll introduce myself. I'm Tomas Wittelsbach. I, um, I was a sculptor for a long time, and then I shifted to um, the digital sculpting. I, my friend Dave Krentz introduced me to ZBrush, and, uh, and it's been a race ever since then, trying to get it to uh, make physical objects, you know? And uh, yeah, so basically, I think that uh, I'll just sculpt and talk and I won't be too project oriented, I don't think. Um, if there's something you guys want to see or something like that, you know, definitely tell me. Uh, any initial questions? <laughs> uh, that's okay. I feel you. I, I just got here myself, so no problem, worry. Um, yeah, so. Basically, I, I just, I got my computer back. I've been working on a mobile studio pro. I've been on the road for like the last seven months. And so I finally got my, uh, my computer back. I got the new, uh, R8 installed. So I think I am missing a couple, uh, yeah, I don't have ringmaster in here yet. Uh, I'm missing a couple plugins, but that's not going to be a big deal. And, uh, yeah, I think that, um, well, yeah, the, the, uh, live booleans is absolutely one of the most awesome things in the world. And the, um, 3d, um, the 3d alpha brushes or the, what are they? VPM? What's the, the, uh, the little, uh, name for them, you know, make from mesh, these brushes. Uh, for iterating, I think that a lot of jewelers are going to be really excited by that. Hello, X Fighter. Um, yeah, so I think, are there any initial questions? Um, I, people are still coming in. I just introduced myself. VD, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Vector something or another. Um, so in my class, I was sort of discussing uh, light open filigree work and then um, talking about how uh, I kind of start to develop my ideas, which is pretty loose. I think that um, I do a few things a little differently than most of um, the people out there. At least it used to be that way. Um, I don't know if people are coming around, <laughs> but um, so my sort of construction and creation philosophies run a little bit in the lines of, I want a whole lot of subdivisions and I tend to work in, um, start my models in that one to 5 million polys. And I like to have, um, anywhere between like four and eight um, subdivision levels, because that allows us to have the ability to have detail down, start to do moving and changing and iterating. And for jewelers, um, most jewelers aren't sculptors. And so for jewelry, you have to find simple solutions and you're also trying to do something that, um, well, you're basically trying to build skews. You know, if you have a ring or a pendant or something that works and that's in your line, um, the real power of ZBrush for jewelry is not just the, um, the organic modeling part of it, but also the, uh, ability to iterate and generate skews quickly. And so that's what um, I think that most of the 
jewelers out there are going to gain from that as opposed to learning how to sculpt being able to create really nice original cool objects um you know a lot of them are desktop uh, or um uh fabricator so they're doing it in metal and the computer is like a third world sort of <laughs> or a third uh um like a third life selection you know i mean it's like it's far easier to kind of come up with the concept of um look i know how to be a jeweler i know how to set stones i know how to do this and then how do i generate files that can um be easily produced and printed and uh and then in turn that iterating is really the power of it so yeah that's i do primarily um jewelry design i do a lot of um weird like little toys and statues and all kinds of weird stuff as well i used to sculpt for ralph partha and citadel and i made uh a lot of miniatures for like made 15 millimeter napoleonics characters for a while i did a lot of kind of um goofy small stuff so when i have free time i, I like to play with that as well um especially now that you can have cheap home printers um i use the form 2 primarily only because it has a large build platform and it um has a very nice collection of various materials that you can use so in some very exciting stuff with like the ceramics and some their uh, material sciences are pretty impressive the solus is a very 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 good printer for um small castable objects if you're just doing uh, because the build platform at 25 microns is very very tiny so as far as prototyping or anything like that it becomes a little tricky because it's only um it's only making objects that are uh one out of a castable resin and then two the build platform is super tiny so but it's it's resolution is gorgeous um so this was something that i did in class but we can go back to here i think here lower res lower res lower res lower res yeah you know just generate it a very simple um z modeler block up and this is often what i'll do i'll just find a base um and i won't go much more than this honestly um this has obviously been sculpted a little so it's normally a little bit more quadded at this point um no i don't i don't use the sculptio i don't i don't even know what it is honestly um <laughs> uh a lot of uh hello how are we doing tonight um because honestly i'm working for the most part and so i tend to only uh drag the tools that are immediately useful and then i <laughs> kind of slowly build on it and build on them and yeah so uh i don't know what the sculptio um i don't even know what sculptio is um is it a is sculptio a um like a what do you call it like shapeways or something like that um yeah so they are a uh what would you call it a i'm having a brain embolism here uh a service bureau yeah no i haven't used them yeah no i especially in jewelry what you have to understand is shapeways and pixiole and these places they're not jewelry places so in turn um you wind up getting not great objects basically you know end of the day it's um uh go to a jeweler if you're going to actually try to make money off of this um you're going to have to deal with jewelers because that's the <laughs> that's the only thing that's out there as far as the quality of object and also just 
the knowledge use the knowledge that's there um, from actually actual jewelry houses and how because depending on the metals you use depending on the um, uh, you know, if you're using Argentinium silver versus sterling silver versus pure silver, I mean, tons of companies have different alloys. They have different properties. Some don't tarnish, some do tarnish, you know, so um, Shapeways and these places don't offer any kind of real support for that kind of specificity, specificity of metals. Um, so you know, if you're just futzing around and you're playing and you just want something in metal, then yeah, sure. I mean, they're fine. You're not going to get good quality surfaces or anything like that. I mean, you know, I know that they're trying to be better um, and they're definitely getting better, but at the end of the day, they're still not jewelry manufacturers. Um, so, yeah. So my my process and how I kind of go about working with things is I tend to start with a very low, um, yeah, let's just go here and start W the new tools here, um, are wonderful. You come in, go 3d cylinder, uh, delete. Delete lower, come back in, cylinder, cylinder. Really, you're just not going to turn into a cylinder for me? What is it saying? Am I getting a message up here? Hmm. Okay, well, that's weird. Will it do it for me here? No, interesting. All right. Well, that's bizarro. Here we go again, me showing things that don't work. Yeah, I understand. Oh, do I? Oh, I have symmetry turned on. You don't want that turned on. I don't think that would do it, but let's see. Yeah. We'll just append a different thing. Oh. All right, there we go. Oh, it just took its time getting there. And then I'll split the parts. Okay. Why are we being so slow? I haven't um, used my computer in a while. So uh, I, like I said, I've been using a Mobile Studio Pro and it uh, it's great. It's just I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not... I'm, Tried to get my, my my desktop kind of going and running here. Let's here. So pick enough resolution where you're not fighting with it. W will slag it back in here. Pick a size, any size. All right. Now we'll come here. And no, I didn't save. See how it is. Uh, we want a center line. We want that to be a little bit more W. And now here, um, I don't know if you guys know how to use the rulers. Um, obviously, if you're just trying to get a bounding box measurement or you know, just the outer parameter measurement, the easiest way is just to go to the 3D print hub, update size ratio. And so this is nine, nine by almost two mil. So this is a little small. Um, it's important to get to the appropriate scale that you want at this point. Um, so, uh, yeah, and you just kind of, keep tapping it see where it is let's get up into like the 24 range there we go 
And now you can go Y and I have mine set up under preferences where um, transpose units. If you'll notice unit scale is one, minor ticks are 10, major ticks are one. And so that gives me this being a millimeter and then um, the minor ticks are tenths of millimeters. So whoever says you can't measure in ZBrush or have no accuracy in the measurement of ZBrush is a little wrong. There is actually really legitimate, very tight scale. Um, it's just a little, you know, you can't click a line and say, oh, what size is that? You know, it's a little bit more um, like using an actual ruler. You have to actually go to the surface, drag it, measure it, and and you can see that, you know, it's accurate. I mean, right here, 3.6, it's going down four um, to four decimal points of a millimeter. So, you know, whoever says that's not accurate is silly. Um, you do have to deal with measuring your shrinkages and a lot of that when you're going to printing, depending on what the materials are. Um, and then going into the actual piece of jewelry, it, you lose anywhere between like two and a half percent and five percent. Uh, in some materials, you can lose up uh, even like 20 percent, like some of the ceramics and things like that have um, some very large shrinkage rates. But once you know the shrinkage rate, you know, you just multiply it out. Um, so if you know that you're losing 2.5 mil, uh, or 2.5% when you're exporting out, you can change um, that size. Caliper Master has a um, an export with percentages, and I'm not sure if this does. Um, size options. Original size. I thought there was a way to get... Um, uh, like a overall multiplier in here. I, I don't know if that was something Joseph and I were talking about doing, or it might be in Ringmaster. And like I said, I don't have Ringmaster uh, installed right now. Forgot that. So basically, I'll start with something as low as possible. You want a center line because if you start wanting to do XZ symmetry, uh, you need that center line, or it won't. It won't give you anything. Uh, it won't act correctly. Also, if you're going to um, try to, all right, why is that not? Oh, it's because it's not center. So I don't know if everyone knows this, but the ability to go to the center of the object, turn off your symmetry, go to the center of the object by hitting um, the little map in there and then hit home. And now you're returned home. That was a, a big issue with the older versions. You had to come in here to position, um, position and type in zeros. And now, you know, that the gumball is just such a powerful tool now. Uh, let's see, just kind of. Uh, turn X on, doo -doo -doo -doo. here we go, boom, reverse it, well, oh, no, we're on a wrong axis, no, that's why, where am I, where's my floor, oh, that explains a lot, okay, never mind, <laughs> Sometimes you need to know where you are in the world. Um, so if you're doing something like this, we'll go back to Y. This is still a really powerful tool, your transpose tool and the um, Alt button, right? So that's just moving, but with the Alt, you can sort of bend. This allows you to do some selective bending and distortion just on specific parts where the um, where these these uh, transforming tools are for the whole part in general. So 
yeah, I'll basically start here. Uh, I will come in here and let's mask off. It's pretty close to there. And then come into Z Modeler. Come here, slide, edge loop complete or partial, but we have it masked, so those two don't matter at the moment. And the key to any of this really shooting forward and trying to um, trying to uh, it the whole thing you're trying to do here is uh, mesh management and trying to control where your geometry is and um, because at the end of the day we have to get these things out of the computer we're not you know we don't have the luxury of being able to do um, the UV stuff and uh, you know we have to deal with actual geometry and the detail we put in needs real geometry it can't be you know like in video games and stuff there's no there's no tricky way out you are stuck with the geometry you have so managing your tool your geometry is incredibly important and so that's why when I come up here we uh, try to make everything just roughly square you know try to keep things as even as possible um, you're not going to get a completely even quad model you know so uh, yeah but normally I'll start here and then I'll divide the living hajibas out of it and I'll go up into that two to seven eight ten million polys um, come on what are you doing oh I hit that button one yeah 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 I know I know really come on just it is in the um, it's not going to let me out yes I know now oh, you are being a complete pain in the butt all right so we're just gonna delete lower to get out of this it's not even going to let me do that. We're stuck in a loop. That is crazy. Mm. Okay. Well, that is super nuts. Here, we're going to have to kill this. It won't even let me kill it. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's weird. Why do we have two versions going on down here? Is it going to let me out of it? Nope. All right. Sorry, guys. We just... When you get... Uh, the brush was... On... Do -do -do -do. <laughs> That's strange. Yeah, so here we go. And I just, I don't know why this thing does this to me either. Yeah, yeah. Um, the whole keeping these things in order for some reason, it's like uh, I have to always come back in here and put them in order because I'm OCD and weird. My brush stroke Z plugin. All right, let's see. That quick save in. No, it didn't. Okay. That is. But you can see I do like weird little figures and things as well. Uh, file. Open. 
It doesn't really matter, does it? Um, did it load? Well, open. No. Quick save. All right, there we go. There we go. All right. So let's just go back to here. I have to change my button size. See how that creeps over that? All right. W. We're going to take this and turn this into a cylinder. Oh, we have to delete lower. Cylinder. Cylinder. Oh, I always forget to turn symmetry off. Okay, there we go. Let's again pick that. Get your geometry in. And the real key is to keep as little geometry as you can in that first block up phase. Uh, w. Well, I know that this is going to be off by about that much. Where are we? 3D print hub, update sales ratio. Nope. Close enough. Okay. And here we go again. And so now, you know, with, uh, if you're thinking or planning at this point, you can use the Z modeler to start punching holes and stuff like that in it. But um, we're just going to go straight into this. We'll divide it up. Like I said, I usually want to get into that 2 million to um, 2 to 10 million. And then you can always go back down in your stack, your uh, resolution stack. And what that does is, what are those triangles that you use to add quads and change the thickness of the cylinder? Oh, it is part of the new transforming tools. If you go to W, it's your gumball. When you come to cylinder, uh, oh, well, of course, this one. <laughs> uh, here. Turn this to a cylinder. So these are just your, um, see it says vertical divide, horizontal divide, and then this is inner radius, right? And so these are the controllers within the uh, transformation tools within the, um, in the gumball. So we come back over here. Yeah, I'm gonna, and we have some subdivisions. So. Normally, I tend to use uh, clay tubes. Clay tubes is my bread and butter. It is the uh, brush I use pretty much for everything at all times for a couple of reasons. One, as I lay things down, it acts like a layer tool, right? So I'm not getting the buildup that like clay buildup gets. And two, it allows me to start the define sharp edges even in my initial conceiving stage because it has this nice square. Um, I'll also always go to smooth stronger because we are using higher base meshes. Um, so you can see how just even at this base level, we can start defining form. And this is why I use both high and low subdivision as opposed to just the lower sub and come up. And that is because a lot of people using the lower subs, 
Oh, let's get down here. You know, you can get stuff in quick and people are moving things around. They're getting your form in and, you know, you're starting to define, uh, you know, oh, I want like a little face here. And yeah, you know, that's how it's going to be. And then I'm going to push it around a little, you know, and that's fine when you're doing the loose block up and you're trying to get your weights in the right places. The problem with jewelry is it's much trickier. We're, we are left with very, very, very limited um, size formats that we can deal with. You know, in all reality, we are trying to get complex design and things that are, you know, four millimeters wide, two and a half millimeters deep. And so I find that it's much better to try to find that vocabulary in the higher res, and then I will start to jump up and down because how I work is I work pretty loose and I don't tend to have a lot of pre-planning in my life. Um, it is, and so we have to center it again. That's fine. Um, turn off X, right? Turn off your symmetry. Go to center and then go to home. There we go. And now we know that our symmetries are going to pan out a little better. Uh, is it some of my booleans? Do you still use Moto? No, I don't use Moto much at all anymore. Um, there are still a handful of things that it's quick to do in Moto or I have older models that are in Moto that I'll use, but I, I'm on Moto 9.2 and I think they're up to 11 now. So I haven't even, I haven't even updated it. Uh, I was actually contemplating that the other day. Is that something I need to do? So once again, clay tubes, we'll turn on symmetry because it's a ring. We'll do a quad symmetrical ring. Where's my floor? Okay. My floor is down. So I'm looking down at the top of this, turn floor off. And, um, and as I work, I'm not too worried about keeping my mesh clean and why a lot of people have problems working on the higher subdivision levels is exactly this. So we've put this down. We haven't been real careful. We've been blocking out and now you try to smooth this. Well, people, you'll always hear the complaints like, oh, well, I can't, I can never get a surface smooth. And they're coming in here and they're trying to use trim and, you know, you're like this. And then you get these little waves in your surfaces. And that's why the subdivision levels are so important because I can, you know, spend a very short period of time doing this and I use my clay tools like I would a clay rake. So I'm laying down lines. So I'm getting um, the shadows and that, that allows me to see the contours of the surfaces better. I find that the Ma Dirty Blue is the best material to use. There's a gray that works pretty well as well, but um, this is the closest material I have found to what the detail will actually show up like in a printer. Because, you know, a lot of these have very melodramatic, where's the one I like so much? Uh, you know, this is great and melodramatic and it looks like you have all these wonderful lines in there and you're like, yeah, you know, this subtle stuff's gonna show up and this is gonna be great. And it's not, that detail's not there. That's a rendering trick, you know? Where here, this is, like I said, this is the um, the closest that I found. So I tend to tell people to use the Mod Dirty Blue only because you're going to get sort of what you have out. Now, the beauty is we can go here, we lower our res, and we smooth it out at the lower reses. Hold on, I've got to turn that thing right. And then higher res. And you just smooth it out, higher res, smooth it out. And that's the way you can control your surfaces much better in the higher. So you have the capacity to come in 
and do some nice defining uh, form. And I, ooh, what did I just hit? Man, that wasn't what we wanted. Um, clay tubes. Mm. There we go. No. Did that not get me back? Oh. Boom. Clay tubes. And then smooth stronger. Really, you're just not going to give me my clay tubes back, are you? Oh, it's because it's in smooth. Smooth stronger. Right, and now we can come here, go into clay tubes, right? All right, there we go. <laughs> Chaos. So I almost never worry about my measurements and thicknesses at this point. I know that I'm roughly the right scale, right? And then I will literally just come in and start blocking form up and since at this point I have no vocabulary of what I'm looking for, I'm trying to find a vocabulary that I'm going to continue this on. This is a little strong. That's why we're getting so much distortion there. I'd like it in here. Yeah. And so I just come in and we just start working on it and working on it and just looking and at this point, I'm not even, you know, we're not defining any form of uh, vocabulary. I'm just trying to figure out my form. And let's build this up. And we'll get this in and build this up. You can see I just sort of work my way to some of these shapes. It's just a nice, subtle creeping up on everything. And um, yeah. Come in, grab my move brushes and start to change them. Once again, you can lower the res a little if it gets a little squirrely. What happened? Oh, hit X. And it seems that a lot of people run into getting off symmetry. Uh, that's another really nice reason to have uh, your um, to have your multiple subdivision levels because you can always go all the way back to your lower subres and um, come up under deformation. And you can smart resim Z, boop, and it'll make sure that on the Z axis, full symmetry is found. And then you go back to your X and do it full symmetry found. So now you know you're symmetrical again. You can come back into your higher reses and um, start working again knowing that if you got off symmetry uh, you can now uh, retain it again oh that's why that's doing that clay tubes again and so you know i'll just work until i find a form i like yeah, let's get that out a little more like okay so that's sort of my weights I'm okay with that you can see that my mesh is still sort of torqued but uh, yeah and you know, once again come in with move and just fuddle about with it until you're getting you know what you're looking for
And once again, I'm not worried about my finger holes. I know it's roughly close. I will come back in with a mandrel, which is the right hole size, and I will reproject or um, um, I will contemplate um, I will contemplate where stones are set. Um, I don't have ringmaster set in, so I don't have the the models of the stones, but with the uh, boolean cut, it's absolutely a fantastic way of dealing with it um, because you just have such nice clean here we'll say this is a cab let's append uh, append a circle boom, ba, da. all right so we'll make this a pearl ring um, so you know let's say you know that you have a five mil pearl why what is that okay let's say you have a 13 mil pearl <laughs> um go back to w just bring it in you know you have to see right here we're breaking the ring rail so you know you have to make sure it's settled off the finger and now we just come in I tend to use move here. Let's go back to here. And you literally just bring this up. And now we're starting to destroy our base mess, base mesh. Um, and this is where a lot of people are like, oh, when do I dyna mesh from that quad model? When do, when are those, you know, when do I make that decision to go to a dyna mesh or a Ziri mesh? And it's when you can no longer use, when your mesh has become unusable in a lot of ways so um you know by doing these stretches or twists you know uh, the twist tool or not twist tool the spiral tool is very destructive you know it's really torquing the hejibus out of your mesh right and so that's hard mesh to work with from then on and that's when you start to you make your decision to uh, uh, use uh, the remeshing. Uh, how are we doing? No one's asking questions. Feel free if you have questions to ask. Um, this is sort of my first run at this, so I'm not exactly sure the best process. You know, I don't know if. Uh, you know, so this is an exploration process for all of us, right? Um, things to remember, you don't want sharp forms right here. You got to remember like from here to here is where the finger will rub constantly. So you want to, um, when you're designing, you want to keep that into consideration. The other thing is I tend to always put what I call a striking plate on the bottom of these because if you have any kind of detail and you want to retain it on the bottom of a ring you need to provide a space for that metal or you know just everyday wear but think about going to the bar with a new uh, cement bar top and you have your lovely new ring and you start listening to the music, you're enjoying it, and you take your ring and you tap it on the counter. Well, now, any of this detail that you've put down here in this lovely bottom part of the ring um, is gone. You've just hammered it flat. And people don't like to lose detail. <laughs> it's, it's something they notice. So if you give them something to just beat on, right, this is going to retain you can be as ornate as you want right here and then this is going to retain your ability to keep detail on the bottom side of the ring because it now has some place that's lifting that contact away from the surface um right and so i now can say okay well we can put detail here right because this is now 
protected sort of and you these can be any shape obviously uh, so now we're changing this a wee bit um, and once again I have I haven't really found a flavor for the part yet we're still working on form not um, or in function not form yeah. we sort of have a little claw thing going on here and so now this is a point you're like okay well am I going to turn this into sort of a gothy clawy ring are we going to and you know you would probably have some idea with who your client is in some ways um, so some of those stylistic decisions are probably going to be made before you sit down but if you're just designing for yourself um, you know these are the points where you're like okay well now it's time to make decisions is it going to be super organic is it going to be hard modeling is it going to be blah 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 so let's go in a different direction this looks like it should be bony and you know kind of organic and let's just take it to a slightly different place and make it slightly architectural and um, everything I do is still going to be very organic but as opposed to looking like meat and bone will make it look like it was a designed hard surface you know and when i say hard surface modeling it's not what you're thinking <laughs> uh, any question yeah, so the other thing you have to remember and this is something that I think even some of the hard modeling or hard surface modelers should learn or pay attention to is it's really easy to make cubes and flat surfaces but one of the major issues with you know when I'm dealing with jewelry we're dealing with a completely reflective surface but even if you're going in the toys and such you know if you have something that has like um, a shiny or high polished surface you're still working with these concepts and the concept is this if and I'll use the SK fill to come back in after I've put an edge and that's an easy way to get a surface back up to another one I tend to use SK trim a lot because um, it the SK brushes he just does such awesome brushes people are like oh do you do your own brushes I was like uh, there are these people out there that do such great brushes <laughs> I don't need to learn how to do it um, because at the end of the day I use clay tubes for the most part so <laughs> I change my settings a little but uh, for the most part I'm using pre-made brushes or um, he's a Japanese guy uh, he does a lot of the anime models the anime toy models and uh, he's awesome and his brushes are awesome uh, there's just such a great resource it's it's funny now with so many people in the forums uh, you know like eight years ago ten years ago eleven years ago there were fewer people in the forums and so you actually got uh, a little bit more advice and back and forth with your peers I think now the forum moves so fast it's hard to get to stay up where the people who come back from work you know missed the post or you know you can subscribe to posts of course but it's it's interesting how quickly things move um, and now that uh, the rendering stuff is so good so much of the stuff is about the rendering and you know that's where I'm saying you because you can make a surface look like whatever you want it to in the program I think that we forget that there are some simple tricks to make these surfaces look good as physical objects and so instead of doing a flat surface here let's take a look at this append cube loop so if you're thinking about how surfaces work right they're reflective here let's go to something that might give us a flash uh, here 
And so a flat surface, if you are finding that reflective spot, it just, you know, it's like a foil wrapper or something, you know, see how it's just one color. There's no movement on that surface. There's nothing. It's just one flat tone where if oops, we take it and so right flash, but if we take it and you put a little bend in it, oops, a little bend in it, see how much motion you get. And this being really low poly actually shows it even better. So even if you're doing something that's supposed to be flat, if you put just a little bend in it, even just that little bend, see how there's a travel on the surface and that travel creates visual interest. Um, I, you know, um, I can try. I, I don't really remember what his name is. I know, um, I, I'm sure I have it somewhere. I'll, I'll try to find it for you. Yeah. Um, and then see, he's, he's well known for what he does. Uh, I just, my memory is absolutely pathetic. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, but I'm sure we can find that out for you. Um, so, and now here you have a complex compound curves and see how much activity there is on the surface. That's real important. And it's something that I really wish a lot of people would pay a little bit more attention to because it makes your models much more compelling and much more dynamic. And especially, you know, in the world of jewelry, you're dealing with stuff that is super small and you have to get a lot of bang for your buck. And so trying to get that bang, you know, you need to think about how surfaces work. So if you have two flat surfaces here, let's polish this out, right? And we're gonna polish this. And how most people do their detail is they'll come in and they cut in detail. We don't have enough resolution for this. Let's divide it some more. Right. They'll come in and they'll cut their detail. Well, your brain, I don't care how many lines you put on this. Your brain is not going to view this as a complex surface. Look, it still flashes as one thing, right? you're only getting that one surface flash because, well, that's not a complex surface. It's an illustrated surface um, where what we're shooting for and what's going to, what has worked generations in sculpture and glass and jewelry and anyone who's making small ornate objects, um, what you learn is having, hold on, let's, oops. Let us, I tend to like the focal shift on my, um, on my masking brush sharper. I want harder edges when I mask a little bit more control, not as much bleed over. And so instead of little lines, what we want are little layers and it's often nice here. Let's do one more. And now we have these different layers. So now, and we're just gone straight. Now you have different layers and the second you move to the left, you're selling height information, right? These are no longer surfaces that are touching one another. It's a complex surface. Well, they're still flat where if you can get away with coming in and 
Y. Alt transpose gives you a little bend. And now let's go to no. Yeah. Are we live? Is anyone left? <laughs> nope. There we go. Are we back? Can people see me? My uh, OBS crashed. A response, anyone? Can anyone hear me? It seems to be going, but is there anyone still here? Can anyone hear me? Oops, sorry, cat blocks. It looks like I'm streaming, but I don't know if my audio is going. I'm not getting any responses from you guys saying you can hear me. Let me go back to this and see. It says I'm... Hmm. Uh, can anyone hear me? Anyone? Can anyone see my um, thing? Anyone at all? Can you hear me? I'm not even getting a no. Um, Hey guys, um, are we, can you hear me? Do we have any concept of if I'm live or not? Should I keep going, guys? I mean, can any of you hear me? Is there anything going on? Hello? Do I need to refresh? Is there something... Okay, so. On DXP is a show that defies description. All of your favorite people in one place playing video games, what could go right? Actually, he described it. <laughs> Polaris Primetime, brand new Saturday at 9 <laughs> on DXP. DXP and its programs are general audience. Described it. <laughs> Polaris Primetime, brand new Saturday at 9 <laughs> on DXP. Okay, DXP. so I have refreshed. Sorry, guys, I didn't. Programs are general audience. Described it. It's new. Polaris Primetime. I'm getting, uh, okay, there we go. Ah, sorry guys. I didn't know I had to reboot my chat. Sorry. New to this. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure that was incredibly exciting. So here we go. Once again, hold down alt the middle button and we're getting a slight bow. Once again, these don't have to be super dramatic. 
But you can now see with just that slight bow, we've changed where these surfaces start to play. And this is kind of a crappy um, material. It's not really doing it. But you can start to see how you can really dictate where the eye travels by bending your surfaces. So the other thing I kind of want to get across here is we have, I tend to use the twist. This is one of his hair brushes. Um, let's turn that down. Let's go over here. Boop. And uh, what it gives you is this lip, right? So you get a round lip and then sort of a scoop. So what this allows you to do, we'll take our SK fill, clay fill, and we'll fill it up behind here. And what this does, as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, just using a flat surface, it gives you this half round edge, right? You get this this round on the edge, which allows that edge to be brighter from a lot more angles. Where if you just have a sharp edge right and you have a nice flat surface well you get the flash there and then you have a constant little edge but it it really is only bright from when this side flashes or when this side flashes right see that's bright no that's bright but that edge is not necessarily compelling so just remember that curves reflect light in much more complicated ways. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this is something I want you to remember, even if you're making figures, if you're making hard modeled objects, if you're doing any of that, I'd say, especially if you're making hard model objects or hard surface modeling, you know, you can easily, you know, get a, Let's say you have a great, oh, look, it's a great, um, right? Just by, instead of cutting the lines in, you just raise the surface just a hair and then come in and why edge to edge. Just give it a little bow or a little recess, you know, and what you've done, you're creating nice curved surfaces that reflect light. And that's super important for complex surfacing. So you wind up with a nice object, right? All right. So we're back to this guy and you can see that I'm not trying to get sharp surfaces. I'm just trying to get nice, clean, smooth surface. Like I said, we're making it a wee bit more architectural than, um, than uh, organic at this point. So these will feel like exterior plates or something in that vein. And uh, uh, do you do commissions? Well, yes, I do. Uh, sort of how I make my money in a lot of ways. I, I, I mean, I do my own jewelry, but I tend to do uh, a limited number of commissions and that allows me the freedom to kind of work at my own hours and take the time I do to go have fun. I'm old. I like to have fun. <laughs> the concept of, of working someplace where I actually had to work business hours. I think everyone would be far happier just to allow me to work from home. You're going to get more hours out of me. You're going to, you know, it's going to be better for everyone. So yeah, commission work is primarily all I do. If I'm working for someone else, that is, you know, um, I tend to use pinches a lot and come back in and get, but once again, pinch is a destructive tool. I don't, use it heavily until I know I'm ready to trash the mesh and then go to a remesh because you can see here we've we've stretched this out to the point that this mesh 
see how distorted it is so if we do come back in and want to put any kind of linear or clean detail on this we have a much you know look at what your surface is here compared to there so once again you're trying to keep your mesh under control for a longer period of time um, and so that's why I tend to smooth put on smooth put on smooth put on uh, clay tubes right and yeah and then I'm just looking for some sort of surface detail or something that catches my eye that I'll then continue on with and carry in as the theme you know and I tend to like sort of the contrast between the organic and the plate or mechanical or hard surface or however you want to describe it and so you just come in and you can see I'm at two million polys right now and uh, it's pretty okay this is sort of a nice soft detail you know these you're not going to get 25 micron details at 2 million but it'll allow you to come in and get a little bit more finesse with the surfaces and like I said you know allows you to make some fairly conscientious decisions about where you want your surfaces and patterning to go um, so you know You'll need a little thickness because if you're going to set it at the point like I'll sculpt it here but then what we will have to do is come back in and once again and then maybe just drag that out a little and that way you're going to be able to drop that pearl in right and then hammer these over so you have to remember you know really right here is not where you want a world of super fine detail because you're going to have to hammer this over or bend it they have setting pliers as well um, and so yeah always be conscientious about how you're going about it what you're going to and where you're going to need um, functional actions right I know that this is going to be a setting so these are going to need to be pushed over or these need to be cups below the half point so that it's not cutting over and then this is straight enough where you can seat the pearl and then bend these over to um, to set the pearl so seat it and then set it and um, yeah so it just come in I've got to turn this up a little more because I want to lay a little bit more material down and now I'm just putting material down I sort of know I want like this lumpy ridgy thing but I don't really have like I said my vocabulary sorted yet and within these I'll find something I like somewhere and usually it just ha it, it'll just come now if you are doing logos or you know um, things that have you know the set details of course you're going to approach it a little different you either bring it in or make the logo first and then apply it through the vector brushes um, but I like just sketching because I think what happens we get tied up in our concepts we're like oh we know that it's going to be this and I, I find that my subconscious is actually a much more powerful designer than my conscious is um, you know I'll go in with a loose idea usually but um, you know if you're just waiting and looking for something to happen it actually lets you edit some of the subconscious material that comes out 
because there are a few things that when you start to get contrived and there's nothing wrong with contrived design it's just going to be contrived it's going to have a very set form you're going to be stuck to it and um, yeah and the problem with that I find is we lose just really wonderful moments you have your brain is trained to recognize symmetry you know the golden ratio and the golden mean aren't some magic thing that Dan Brown or these guys figured out you know it's this is the natural language that our brains see and speak in so you know there are um, these ratios and these concepts of perfection and concepts of beauty that are just sort of like the waveforms that our brains function in and symmetry is a big one so you know there are all these tests where people are like oh we'll take these 10 people and put them in order you have 10 15 seconds to put them in order and uh according to who's the most attractive you know and 99 percent of the time we put them in the same order and that's because those pictures are contr contrived specifically to be more to less symmetrical and we like symmetry and so when you're doing your designs and once again this works with everything um you know not just jewelry but creatures and hard metal or, you know tanks and spaceships and backgrounds and whatever you're doing this is a real important thing to remember is that your brain looks for symmetry if it finds symmetry it will not spend time trying to define that area so if you have forms that are very symmetrical very clean your brain looks at it identifies that it's symmetrical and it moves on where if you are playing with the symmetry and playing with the rhythm of your shapes um, you will wind up with something that the the brain um, will work on it will continue to look at the part it will continue to dig around it'll try to see it'll try to resolve the problem that it is finding and so i think it's real important to play with those forms and shapes so if you have something that is here let's you know you have this shape and then you have this shape and then you have this shape well that's not very compelling design you know these are unless of course you're going for something that's very solid very repetitive very staid of course but I don't do much of that so I'm not going to teach you how to do much of that um, you know having the concept of directing the eye so if you come here and you sort of point at the things you're doing big arrow going up little arrows pointing into the arrow you have directionality in your design now doing something where let's say you're doing hash marks and you know they're tight and they get looser you know these are ways of dictating where the eye travels and um, I'm trying to get uh, someone who does eye mapping software to work with me I've, I've contacted him and he has a thing that's kind of working but there's a lot of eye mapping stuff in marketing and some art analysis after the fact but I don't know of anyone who's doing it in the creation process and I think people would be surprised at how our eyes travel on surfaces you know and you have a lot of control in how you dictate where the eye goes in your part and that's where even changing the reflection surface you know if it has a dip in it it's going your eye is going to follow that light curve if the light is traveling right you know let's say you have a nice scoop in here and the eye is traveling along that 
that will lead the eye up to the here, right? You know, and from a distance, you'll see that movement. And that's why diamonds are so compelling. You know, I mean, really, what's a diamond? It's a friggin' clear thing. Who cares? Well, why they have that flash, you know, they're so dense that light slows down in them and you get these elongated flashes and you can, I mean, a perfect cut diamond with perfect clarity is mind numbing. You can see it from across the football field. I mean, they, they flash and you're just like, what was that? And that's why diamonds are so compelling because they really do sort of defy what our brain thinks it's going to see. And so, you know, giving your brain or giving your viewer's brain something that's unexpected will get it into that problem solving mold. It'll be like, oh, what was that? What am I seeing? Why? Why is it happening? And, you know, it's all happening incredibly fast and, <laughs> you know, uh, incredibly subjectively because well you know we don't really see anything our brains are just interpreting electronic resp or, you know electrical responses from a, an organic organ that you know our brain is inside a box with no light it, it doesn't see anything it's only filtering things in and so that's why you know there are these great optical illusions that are powerful because our brain is sort of trying to prejudge what's about to happen from, you know, these soft comparisons that it has dealt with before. And that's, it's sort of interesting with some of the research in, uh, what are they saying? You know, free will and this and that, because they're saying that your, your brain is actually making prejudgments before you make a conscientious decision about it. And it's fascinating. And we know that it works with uh, color and tone, you know, often when you're looking at, uh, you know, there's the great example of it where it's uh, like a cylinder and um, it's a checkerboard floor. And this looks darker than this one because it's in a shadow. So the comparison between the two tones, you know, it, it, you're completely judging tone by what it's surrounded by. And so in turn, you're constantly judging surfaces by the context and what they're in. And that's where I think that using visual rhythm or surface rhythm, you have a nice flat surface, but then you have a chattery surface and that chattery surface will dictate where the eye is traveling while you're doing it. And so you can see here, I'm just drawing these in, right? And once again, they're not real exciting. Where, right? Not super compelling. Let's get rid of them. And just see how, once again, using the twist and coming in. Oh, it. You don't want to use um, quad symmetry while using twist. It'll only work on one. Um, um, it'll only work on one axis. So you can see here, this is the curves here and here the curves here. So if you're going to use twist at this point, choose one. I'll choose X. So my they'll be symmetrical left and right. And you can see how this is a lot more compelling just because it has a little roll on it than the straight dark hatches. The other thing is this is about half the depth but twice the visual punch and that is something you constantly have to worry about in jewelry because you don't have a lot of depth to play with and you can see how that is just a lot more interesting you're getting a lot more visual play on that surface the surface is now complicated it's not just cut in right it's not just this Oops, sorry 
Saving. Um, and I hope you can see that. I'm like looking at the little screen there. I don't know if that's coming across. Is that coming out clear? Can you guys see the differences here? As opposed to this. Right. This. And here we can even do it on the flat surface there. Let's... Right? I mean, do you see how these are much more dynamic? Sorry guys, that's just super odd. It's not the connection. It seems to be uh, OBS keeps crapping out. Um, sorry about that. So um, I, I assume that you can see the dramatic difference in those two things. And what's nice, if you look at the profile, look at how much more shallow these are. And even if you cut these deep, you're still going to get so much more dynamic play off a surface that's doing this than a surface that's doing this. Because your brain is going to identify this as the same surface with lines cut in it, where these are surfaces that are going in, under, over, in, under, over. And so even when you start to do nice, flat, clean detail, you're going to wind up much better off instead of saying, oh, well, I have this panel. Ooh, hold on. I have a panel going right here, right? Compared to I'm sorry. Compared to Let's just do this. Oh, we're on. Turn these off. W. And let's just, we'll make it just bigger. And we're just going to pull this up a little. Right. And then that compared to that and then compared to this. And then, once again, I'll use the SK clay fill behind and fill up that back edge, right? And you can see how this is not very compelling at all. This is, you know, better because you have a surface change there. But this is best, and you can clean this up to where it's sharp. I'm, I mean, these are soft, and you're like, oh, well, I want my tank to have sharp edges. Well, you can. You know, you can clean this up some. I don't know if you know about uh, Lazy Nazumi uh, here. Boop. So Lazy Nazumi is this really cool program that will hook into any other program. Come on, there it goes, that red line. And then you get these wonderful constraint tools. Um, so if I want this to be really sharp and crisp, I can oop, do that and then hold down control, bring this over, get my line in, and then I can do that. And so you can draw a really nice when you're doing it, you know, you can come in and draw really nice controlled lines 
Uh, come on, why are you being a pain? Normally you can. Right. And this also has, this has a bunch of great tools, but the other thing that makes this worth every penny, I think this is like a 20 buck, 20, $25 program is, um, where's ellipse? There it is. And so you, you know, for those of us who try to draw circles on things and um, <laughs> you uh, try to get the radial to work for you, well, no, here. And now you can just draw circles wherever you want. And it works with radial symmetry. It works with everything else. Um, and so, you know, you can come over here and draw your circle. The other nice thing is hold down control and you can um, change the direction and change the shape. See, you can actually make it an oval and it just, it's a brush constraint. And so it really allows you, and if you hold down shift while you're, so control and then shift it, it locks on, um, it locks on your degrees. You, and they're completely programmable. It's crazy. It has tons of different things, but also radial lines is a pretty good one. You can use it, you know, to get, oh wait, radial lines, right? But I don't know, this is uh, really good, worth every penny. Um, it does silly things like little gears. <laughs> I mean, it does all kinds of wacky stuff, but all of this stuff's programmable and uh, they use, um, I actually tend to use this um, lazy mouse because I like the pulled string and I can change how it works and stuff. So I don't use a lot of the, the new lazy mouse except for using it as the constraint tool, like when it has its constraints. Uh, so lazy Nizumi is awesome. It's a great tool, but I mean, sorry, distracted me there, but you can see how this actually reads very well compared to this. And if you look at, uh, a lot of, um, people's sculptures, you know, they're, they're like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to put wrinkles in pants. All right, well, here, we're going to do a wrinkle and a wrinkle, and it kind of dents in here. And, oh, look, now we have that sort of wrinkle. Well, that's not wrinkles in pants. That is, you know, that's uh, lines on surface. And I just think that uh, a lot of people forget to sculpt when they're doing small detail stuff. And so... I think that's one of the things I try to get across a lot um, that, you know, motion, visual motion, um, you know, uh, just trying to keep rhythm and form, you know, it's, uh, you know, they're great, great masters at this stuff. And the more you see and the more you read and the more you research education is the best way for design you know i mean you can sit there and practice in your room all night but until you've seen beksinski and how he captures motion and how he uses tertiary tones and you know mobius and how you know his very simple linear texturing and um yeah i think that you have to expose yourself to as many things as you can, you know. Uh, sorry, we're not making a very compelling piece of jewelry here, are we? <laughs> um, but let me see. I think I have this guy in here too. Um... This is an inset panel for the sugar skull. Let's look at that. 
wow, some of this. I haven't touched this computer in a long time. It's been seven months since I've had my poor computer open. Um, here, actually, I think that this will work. So here is something that the sugar skull, come on, the sugar skull. Um, another very important thing going to the inside of your rings. This was flipped because I was using it to project. Um, flip. Come on. You can do it. There we go. So you can see that uh, I made this and then I made a separate piece so it could be inset as a different color metal. And this is probably one of the flattest linear designs I've done. And that's specifically because this is supposed to look like, you know, um, the sugar skull. So these are supposed to be just, you know, like cake dressing or something, you know, so just squeeze out tube. So you can see that this is straight linear. But the second we get into trying to do this, making these as steps, right, even in this form here, this is in front of this, which is in front of this, which is in front of this. Thinking of these things in layers, right, that is a lip that's actually above this surface. And, you know, you can see these round curves in here and just trying to keep the stuff round and nice curved surfaces are going to give you a lot of good light reflection. The other thing I would say is sculpt on the inside of your jewelry. It gives people little secret stories to tell, you know, like put little, like little dumb hearts up in there. Or, you know, I'm often putting, I use this area to put things like letters, numbers, or things that are relevant that are these cute little stories that allow people to, um, get excited and feel good about their pieces of jewelry because these are personal journeys, you know, and uh, people buy jewelry to, um, you know, make landmarks in their lives. And you can see here, even in this, um, come on, even in the little vignette in the back here, actually, I think this is on a separate sub tool, isn't it? Or a separate poly group. Oh, well. But you're kidding me. Okay. But I'm going to, before I close this out, you can see here even, see how these are rounded surfaces that, you know, this isn't just drawn in. And I do use the flat area here because that is going to read as a flat surface where even these are just the slightest curves to them. You know, this has curves to it. Um, you know, this is going to read and project light very much different than this area here. So, you know, you can use this is a flat surface in comparison with this is a draped surface. And in, you know, this is less than three millimeters deep from the highest to the lowest. Actually, I mean, it's less than a millimeter. Um, and sorry, we crashed. I'm having all kinds of joy today. Come on, come on. -do 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 -do. Oh my God, dyslexia is a horrible thing. <laughs> right? It's live. <laughs> uh, and then I'll bring up a figure as well and uh, kind of show you because he's real simple at this point. Where are we? Doo -doo -doo -doo. Time wise. Good morning. Let's see. 21. So we have 20 something minutes. Is that what I'm seeing there? Here, 
let's go to this guy because he should we do mermaid yeah let's just go here Piano. There we go. So even if you're doing figurative work, right? You know, you can see how I really like to try to push these ideas of, sorry, brush, my brush, stroke, Z plugin. If I don't put them in the right order, I can never find things and then I'm, nah. So, you know, even here, just that concept of a surface traveling under another surface, you know, it's like, I think it's real important that these aren't, you know, and I'm just coming back through and accenting this a little so you can see where my decision making was, right? And it's nice when you get things that change sides sometimes, right? Um, but you can start to see how by making a decision as that is in front of that compared to that is behind that compared to that is a line. Oops. Right. This, you get away with so much more visual information in very shallow, very little depth, you know, and it allows you to really control the story you're telling in the piece. I think that, uh, you know, if you just came in and did this, right? Well, what's your brain do? Your brain like that sucks you know i mean it's like your brain looks at it and you're like oh well this is obviously someone taking a tool and cutting lines in right where if you're using nice subtle transitions and over and unders where your surfaces are transitioning right then these become much more much more interesting things going on and I know that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I mean, look at people's work. You know, you you will start to see how people don't um, don't layer things. They don't decide that things are going over one thing and under another. You know, and it really tells a different story. This, right, is a completely different thing than this right and then if you spend the time and actually get it to go under a touch mask it move just push it a touch you know now you have much more complicated surface stories and your brain is going to start to read and understand those and those become very powerful visual storytelling tools, right? So I think one of the things that I'll always try to get across is, yeah, oops, that's huge, is, you know, it's, it's easy to draw the detail in. It's much better to have it be a level change because when you start getting your reflections not only are they just more compelling objects but when you start to get your reflections off the actual pieces come on let go all right that is a whole lot more interesting than that right 
It's great for pinning a reference image over your software. You can dial down the train. Oh, nice. I'll look at that. Um, so, you know, I, you know, the stories I'm telling are jewelry issues, but I really think it's important that people understand that these are issues in any sculptural object. And so, uh, there's my twist, you know. You know, having things have real weight transition, having think, you know, This is a goofy little figure guy. Uh, let's, there's his head. Yeah. Just start with him. It's funny, I actually have the one. This is sort of a scrunched up bat face. Um, the actual finished head is funny. But, you know, so I think, or I hope, I'm trying to get that point across about this, what and how you lay in your linear detail is so important, especially on small objects, because you have so little depth and so little room to start to sell these depths, you know? And here, let me find a picture. Boom, boom. No, that's all right, let's go here. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And so you can see this is an early version of my piece. And then you can see how when people start to knock it off, you know, this stuff is easy to match because it's super simple, you know, linear. But when they get into the like smaller flowers and you can tell that, you know, they at least try to get some depth in there. But this, and you can see this is flat but even there see how they're nice little subtle steps and in the reflection this reads very well um, yeah and you can see by changing it um, I've really started to punch and change these transitions quite a bit for that um, uh, for that uh, inlay piece and even here, like, you know, it's a very easy solution to kind of come in and just draw lines, but getting these to have roll and it's funny because, you know, this detail shows up super nice and it's supposed to be silly. You know, it's like those, um, it's like the little Mexican day of the dead. Um, no, those aren't symmetrical I have X on don't I um, little day of the dead statuettes but you know here we're let's turn sideways here you know we're still only dealing with oops, sorry why no that's no oh. so sometimes you guys you get this um, I guess I had deselected edit and you're trying to do this and it won't edit you're stuck in that two and a half mode um, the easy thing is just go to the star grow the star edit and then go to the sub tool you want to go to control n clears it but you know here let's oops right. You know, the depth of this detail is super small. Why? 
you know, you're dealing with four tenths of a mil there, you know. And what's nice is these things show up, and that's a deep part, right? So by having curves on these surfaces, you can get away with really nice ornate detail that reads because of the curves. Um, and let's just look at one more thing here. I think... Let's... So this is, um, I think, come on, we are just chugging along. I wonder how big this model is. Yeah, wait for it, wait for it. I have some big models. Some of my production models are like eight gigabytes. <laughs> I, uh, I get a little silly. Um, uh, so for the really like for my production jewelry, I use a um, solid scape machine. They start at about twenty eight thousand and they run to about um, I think their top of the line one is thirty eight, almost forty. Um, but the problem with that it's it's not a great home well one it's expensive of course but two it's not a great home machine because you have to keep it running have to keep it running it's persnickety it's but there's nothing like it it is by far in my book the best printer for printing subtle surface differences one second water oh look you can see me drinking <laughs> okay so this is a simple over and under you know like a little celtic knotty looking thing oops right but once again here we have very little height difference right you're dealing with an object that's fairly thin um this is fat right now it gets cut to this surface so um and yeah you asked how and what's wonderful about the new version so before i would have had to flip this right bring this up i would have had to come in here and uh Would have had to come in here. Oh, no. Come on, shift, change, go to the other one. Come back to this, right? Sort of scrape it down. And then, then project it. And I'll still do this for some things, but uh, project it, clean it up project it again and then that's how you get the surfaces to match where now you know let's face it you know you just come in here you go this guy flip make this the start make this negative show live boolean and there you go you have surfaces that hit match and key in perfectly so i mean you can see how absolutely incredible the live boolean stuff is for the jewelry and being able to make things that key into other pieces perfectly. Um, you know, and here, once again, you can see once I got into the organic stuff, I am coming back because this is very thin. I will come back in and I will accent some of these highlights, but those lines when I use a line, it is literally going to be a bright white reflection, right? And once again, it's not flat, it is round. So, you know, we're still dealing with, uh, here, let's get back to this guy. You know, transitions in height. This isn't just drawn in, you know, things are sitting behind one another. 
and this is tiny. I mean, hold on. W. Oh. Y. You know, that's a mill right there. That's only a mill wide. You know, that's a mill and a half. And you can, because of the textures, because of the shading, that reads awesomely. It's beautiful. But once again, you need a SolidScape printer to pull this stuff off. Like, um, you see a lot of these things winning print competitions, and they're just really thin, wiry um, constructs. Well, any printer can print those for the most part, as long as you have your wall thickness stuff. So I have a Form 2 here at home, and I can print something that's half mil wire all meshed together on that. Um, where, oh yeah, <laughs> someone did. <laughs> um, where this is what the SolidScape picks up better than anyone, is that it'll pick up the subtle surface detail and that's really how you can tell the great printers is, you know, they'll pick up this subtle stroking and these changes in levels. And I mean, like I said, what two, this, that's, yeah, that's a mill, a mill. So you're dealing with on this stuff, super tiny stuff. And yet again, the knots work really well because you have you know, this distinct over and under, over and under, over and under, you know, and that is what is selling the knots. It's how the knots work well, because a lot of people you'll see just have, you know, it's just a, this and let's take flatten a little and just flatten that out some. And then they'll get, you know, and what's going to read better? What's going, you know, and then people are like, oh, well, you need to put more detail in, cut the details deeper. You can cut the detail as deep as you want. It's not going to sell overlapping, um, it's not going to make overlapping objects. It's not going to read as an overlapping object. Do you get the piece printed so you can make molds yourself or do you order it as a 3D printed metal piece? Depending on the part. Um, some of the stuff we print in metal, uh, it, printing in metal is fairly cost prohibitive unless you're doing um, lots of pieces. Like, you know, if we were just pricing some parts in titanium, Excuse me. And um, those parts, if I were to get one piece, then it was going to be um, something like $200 for the piece. But if I got an entire print bed, then, um, then the pieces wound up costing like 25 or 30 bucks a piece. So then that becomes much more cost sensical right you know it makes sense to do that as opposed to um oh it's loading oh did it just die again cry me um <laughs> this is just sorry guys uh i'm gonna have to work on this a little more hopefully we'll get this a little bit more sound um but uh, where was I saying before it crashed? Oh, but you know you can get it for um, you know twenty to thirty bucks a piece, but you're spending well that's exactly it. What's the volume of the bed? You're spending um, you know like four thousand. Okay, I was like what? In the hell? You know you're spending like four or five thousand dollars. So if you actually have you know, something that, um, if you have something that you're going into production with, then making um, a production part that is 
that you're getting seven thousand dollars worth of the um, worth of the parts well that's cool if it's a one-off part you can see where that becomes fairly cost prohibitive um, and so here's another example of really tiny detail but they work because of the stepping right that over and under really is what carries and this has been decimated for printing but you can see even here it's real important to have these faces that catch light you can see them right and so um you know in this printed lovely i mean this sh it's very clear it shows up well you know uh this that was kind of silly here this becomes a real nightmare to mold it was cut uh it's this was a pain in the butt to mold we came in and i've changed it since then and you start to fill in some of the stuff so you don't have these weird mold printches and um but at the end of the day this printed beautifully it came out lovely you know what would do you recommend for other artists to do that don't happen to have spare 30 <laughs> well uh the um uh go to a real casting facility i mean um like casting house uh is who i used before we set up our own shop with William Henry. Um, you know, there are a number of real casting facilities that have the machines. There's that, uh, there's a, I can't remember what it's called. It's a 3D printing service that tells people put their, um, put their, uh, their printers up online. And so, like, I have, you know, the Form 2 here, and if I wanted, uh, I could join that service and say, hey, I got a Form 2, you know, I can print on the Form 2. Um, so, hi, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting. I've been crashing a little, you know, <laughs> my face sculpt sucks. Yeah, that could be true. <laughs> Once again, it gets really tricky, guys. You know in how you're um no i don't use shapeways uh shapeways is okay i wish i mm, i have uh some picture i'll try to for next time i'll try to find the pictures of the things that happened at shapeways um they're not jewelers so you're not getting um yeah i can show you that uh you're not getting um you're not getting a jeweler's conscientious decision making on finishing you're getting someone who's either throwing it in a tumbler or not doing it at all so um uh yeah shapeways and stuff i mean it's great to get a cheap prototype of the part which one of these has gm okay here's 11 million um here i have this brush i think i am in single beads with stones there we go and so this is a let's just do this oh, come on what's going on why are you why are you acting like that let me go to a different right here so let's say you want to set stones on this surface um uh, shape please. yeah i love the form too uh well i mean to be deadly honest uh the form two is wonderful for i would say 85 percent of what most people will do the solace beats it a little at the very fine details um but if you're curing it right um it really uh 
it, it really is a perfectly clean machine, you know. Uh, so what I would do here, bring this in. You can s I'm doing this straight on a thing. I have one of these that'll follow the surface, but I'm just going to give you a quick idea. You get it to where the girdle is where you want it, right? And I'd probably come in here and we'd, you know, if you were really doing this right, you do this and you, you rotate this, oops, you know, you'd rotate them up, but I'm not going to spend the time right now doing it perfectly. So, so you get them to where the girdles are in. I tend, if I'm using a brush, you know, obviously this is laying on this. I will split to similar parts. Okay. And then I have, um, subtool, come on. I have my, um, my prongs. And these are beads, but you have your beads, your prongs. Um, on, on Millie, it's, it's good to have it like about 4.5 mil above the girdle. So for a rendering, this is fine. But remember, if you're actually going to have this produced, don't forget to make your prongs um, tall because they have to have metal to knock them down to set the stone. So make sure your prongs are up high. And then I will take these. Hold on, let's hide this and let's hide this. No, it is this piece that we're on. Okay. So we're going to bring this up. We're going to bring this down. Nope, down. We're going to use that to start. We're going to use that as, a, as an additive. The stones are now subtractive right live boolean and you'll notice let's see yeah they're cutting into see how the girdle is cutting into the stone all you have to do is bring it down touch it and there you go and you you don't want that to cut out of the uh, prong or the bead because your stone setter is going to use a burr, get it in there and kind of wiggle it around and it, it cuts that out. So, um, does that answer your, uh, question about how you do, uh, the surfacing or how to set a stone into a surface? And so normally what you'll do is you'll have cutters. Um, it's fine to do that because at the end of the day, you don't want to try to set the stones unless you're working with the stone setter. Um, if you don't know anything about stone setting, you're going to do something wrong and your stone setter is going to want to punch you in the eye no matter what you do. Um, so whoever you're having doing your stone setting, talk to them and make sure to give them what they want, not what you think you should be doing. Um, remember that for the most part, we are not jewelry, we are not jewelers, we're jewelry designers. And there are jewelers in the world who uh, really hate the fact that people who aren't jewelers are doing this stuff. <laughs> because you make a lot of really arbitrary bad decisions when it comes down to uh, uh, um, yeah, you, you really, you know, I get students and they're like super gung ho and excited and they're like, Oh, I'm going to buy a molding thing and I'm going to get a casting machine. And I'm going to do all my molds. And I'm going to, I'm like, dude, you need to learn how to design. You know, I mean, these are really separate jobs and there are people who are really good at those jobs, you know? And so, uh, you know, you may be, you know, a formula one driver, but, you know, even at that level, ask, you know, ask button to change his brakes. You know, that's not going to happen. You, you, you get the people who are good at their jobs to do this. And 
unfortunately, jewelry is an incredibly collaborative um, art. And when I was just doing my sculpture, you know, it was me. Now I'm dependent on a lot of other people for making good work. And that has been one of the massive struggles of my career is trying to get people who are willing to put the time and energy into making my work what I want it to be because I'm fastidious and anal and uh, yeah, ask Tony, he, uh, <laughs> poor guy. He's the jeweler I deal with. So how do I do filigree work? Are we talking about um, like floral filigree or just thinny filigree? Let's see, do I have anything up here? I don't know that I have anything filigree e e. Oh good. Yay, my counter change, that's a big bonus. Um I mean, are you talking about something like that, or are you talking about um, like traditional scroll work? Um, it's tricky. I don't have my, uh, let's see what's in this model. Oh, that's a scalpel. That doesn't even have something I can use to show you. Here, let's... <clears throat> Here, we'll just open this. I can turn this into scroll work. No. Yeah, I, it's... Um, everything, I have all these hard drives, and I didn't have time to hook them up to this machine. Um, so I don't know where... In, well, you know what? Maybe I did. One sec. Uh, oh, you know where it is? Here, I can download it. Astro Cat Clown. <laughs> These are house rings. Ten good girls seated. Uh, nope. Interesting. I thought it was there. Filigree mm. skull. Import STL. <clears throat> oh, see, I can't brush my brush stroke. I'm so bummed. I had these where these came in an order. And then something happened and they don't come in an order anymore. And I have to redo it every time because I'm crazy. <laughs> and I can't find anything if it's not in the right order. Uh, desktop. There you go. Sassy ghost bunny. Hmm. Filigree skull ring. Come on, where are you? Oh, there he is. All right, so this is the filigree skull ring, I think. Is this what, the one you were talking about? Um, yeah, I did. Well, we printed them. We're waiting for a price on them in titanium, the, the glasses. Um, um, 
<laughs> dildo whistle yeah uh <laughs> i see you saw that uh yeah there's uh an alien form that i've been using and uh it's a whistle format of it <laughs> uh, it's awesome all right so here let's just let's dynamesh this so i can that's fine and then divide 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 okay and so yeah once again the the concept of the filigree stuff is you know you hear me say it over and over and over and over again it's all about contrasting um the over and under the forms and keeping things from being flat you know it really just comes down to that here let's do this so let's we'll just take oops, hold on we need this part right. so just come in yeah that's still too high no wonder and uh, so the first thing I'll do is I'll just get my form, right? It's like, you know, you know, and let's see, that's probably doing that and then that. Okay. So that's our rough shape. Let's get rid of some of this so it's not confusing. said go okay so we have our little guy right so I've decided this is where we want um, yeah they did um, yeah that's that's something that's it's it's in its little phases it's a good thing so this is a rough shape right we're like okay we have a scroll and um, there's some really good books on the philosophy of scrolls. Um, there are real formulas for, you know, the percentiles and all of that. And, you know, I, once again, if uh, I don't know if you guys have seen. Um, come on. Oh, wrong button. Another plugin I'll use every once in a while just to um, what's it called? <laughs> Pi, Pi matrix. Where is it? There it is. Um, this is a really good little program, and it allows you to have interactive. Um, Phi, uh, grids, right? And so you can start to lay out things to the golden mean and the golden ratio. Yeah. And so this is just, um, uh, this is just your standard, um, Phi breakdown. So it's 1.681. Now, um, the golden rectangle and then your golden spirals. So here, let's, this is going that way. Where, like that one, boop, there you go. And so this will give you an idea of what you're, if you're on proportion or off proportion. I tend, I won't really use it for layout. I just do my own layout and then every once in a while I'll come in and start to see if things are a little weird I'll, I'll throw the thing on top and then um, um, I'll check my proportions sometimes like if something's really bothering me um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
I'll bring in one of the grids and look at it and you can start to see where things line up and don't line up and so you know in all reality this is pretty good you know your points are on the the nice thing is that you can change how the grids work where they're left and right top and bottom you can change the amount of lines and you can really start to tune some of these things to where you want them. you know you can come back in and kind of make sure your your points are on grid point you know if you want to get anal about it on the school or on this skull that was worthless there's no point in it being on but this is a really good way to just come in and go oh well if i just move that a touch and i move that a touch now it's actually on perspective or on proportion and it has all kinds of things like it has uh face proportions right and so that gives you facial proportions and you can change like you know the size angle shape of the face and that'll tell you where all of your things are supposed to hit um, it has just all kinds of um, different uh, different options you know it gives you pentagrams and you know all kinds of stuff so I find this is a really good proportion tool that I tend to use after I'm done working um, so you know, let's I like my proportions better um, so then what I will do is find the direction of my curve we have a big hole here that's not helpful but I think you'll get the idea so one of the things I preach about a lot is um, like motion in your curves weight in your curve so if you're thinking about these curves being let's say uh, like tubular water balloons right and so when you move them or whip them around you know the the water has gravity so your curves should have gravity they should have motion and so you can see here this is what a lot of people do right and they have this and then they're like okay well I'm gonna cut that in like that and okay wow there we go look I have a a floral or a, I mean a, a, a scroll well I like to see gravity right I want to see this coming out over here and you start to define where the weight of the curve is so I want this to read heavy so this is going to read thin because when we come in here we want this to be an area that we can use transitionally so this is coming in thinner it's getting weight but then what happens it gets thin and then you get weight right the other thing you get is crossing over weight so this is a really nice area where I want something to happen so I'll probably do a cross over here so I'm gonna you know contrapasto works um, and I'll start to define that high ridge or my high point and so now this comes down and then you also have on a good scroll you have convex and concave faces so right boom here's the fat part of gravity we have this nice crossover here that means that we're also going to get a little bit of weight down here and you can sit there and try to build things up every once in a while you'll have dents don't be afraid just to use move you know and just make sure everybody's sort of where they want to be because you'll find you keep getting weird spots and it looks like some it's because you have a dimple this way and if you're only working from one direction you know you're going to miss some of these things where 
the smoothness of these curves have to be from all directions. These are sculptures. These are going to be printed or milled or something. So you got to remember it's coming out of this machine and in turn it's going to be seen from different directions. Always, always, always move your pieces around and look at them. Um, and so you can see I'm just going to start tuning in some flavor here. Shoot, do, 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 do. And so we want convex, concave, right? So this surface is going bubbling over. This surface is cutting under. So I want them to be projecting light in different directions. So this is a scoop in. This is a scoop over. And what happens is you get these really nice contrasting flashes. So as this is coming over, right? I'm just going to use snake hook as an example. So what you have is your light is reflecting like this, right? So you get this nice light reflection coming around. And then as you come into a scoop, you get this light reflection that's coming right back and in. So you get this nice flash on the inside as you roll into your curve. So having that contrasting um, surface uh, planes, I think is real important. So we've decided that this is going to scoop. And you can see I'm not being super careful about my surfaces just yet. That's going to cross over. And it's going to come into that, let's say. So we'll probably, this will read. It won't be a full crossover, but we'll get a transition here. Well, we can. We'll cross over here. Wait. Scoop. And so we're just... And see that little dent right there, or that bulge right there. That's what I'm talking about. You need to look around because these want to be smooth curves, right? So just bring that in and you you start to identify some of the problems early where you're not trying to sculpt your way out of that. You can literally just move it. The other thing to remember is there are very few problems that you can't just sculpt your way out of it. Just keep moving material and you'll start to see um, resolutions. Um, all right, so we have that. Um, high res, high res. I want a little more. It won't let me divide with it. Uh, the lowest subdivision. Okay. Sometimes that changes. Lower. Let's give it one more division. Okay. Oh, for God's sake. Man, this is jumpy. Sorry, guys. I don't know why this is crashing so much. Um, I think I... It's the Ma Dirty Blue, M-A-H, Dirty Blue. Um, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best material for um, for printing because you can, there's a gray that's pretty good, but um, it allows you to uh, really see... It, it allows you to see the, it's as close to the actual depths 
that are going that you're going to get um, from your part. Um, okay, desktop. Let's go down. <laughs> Frame. Ma dirty blue. <laughs> Edit, control, and so what you can start to see is it's important to, oops, sorry, this is the decimated version. Um, let's just divide it up and it should be fine. There we go. You know, it's important that you have these transitions. And um, some of these, this one has been bubbled out a little more than I normally will because these are really thin. And so this isn't um, the best example of scroll work because there's some physical properties that I had to deal with on this piece because once again, I'm trying to get this done in titanium and it gets persnickety. So these are a little bubblier than I normally would have them. But you can see how there's a transition of weight. And normally, I'm going to punch this a little more. But because this is really wire filigree, um, you know, these are super thin. So it was easier just to get it as a linear. But, you know, I normally I'm going to do something where you have a scoop here and then this becomes the other direction. And I'm pretty consistent with my filigree doing it this way. Um, like I said, this just happens to be a part that requires some specific anatomy uh, and the material has some demands that I had to deal with or that I am dealing with. We're about to send a copy of this and trying to get it done in stainless steel. And uh, I can anodize the stainless steel and it'll be really tough and real affordable to make, you know, so I can actually have something that's cheap and fun and colorful. And But um, yeah, so under normal circumstances, I think that these transitions and curves are really, really important. If you crash again, I'm going to scream. And this is crap geometry because I just divided the dyna mesh, or I mean the decimation. But, uh, and you know, getting things where there's a transition. Up, down, in, out. Yeah. Crappers. Right. Does that make sense? The question about the filigree. Yeah. And you just get, once again, you just get these nice transitions. Um, where are we with time? So I will. I guess I've gone over time, or have I not gone over time? I can't tell time. <laughs> I have no idea what we started. Uh, oh, we're right there. I've almost gone an extra hour. Um, all right, so I guess I don't want to take up a too big a block of time. 
Are there any other uh, questions or anything uh, that anyone would like to know real quickly? Bueller. I don't, that's something I don't know. Uh, that's, I, I'm, um, it, this is my first time doing this, so I have absolutely no clue. I don't think I'm going to run over into anyone else's time, but, um, um, but yeah, so, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I got my, uh, my little express key remote, but I couldn't, I didn't get it installed quick enough. Um, I, it just showed up today, so we'll be able to talk about that. I'm looking forward to that because I usually hold the keyboard in my lap and then work. Um, so we'll see if I can get this to work and that'll be cool. And the other thing, I don't know if anyone heard, did everyone hear that uh, they're coming out with a 32 inch Cintiq? 4k <laughs> just so sexy um so we're gonna see how that works out try to get uh that so yeah um sorry it was a little bit of a cluster tonight uh you know uh it was a little chaotic as far as crashing and stuff Um, yeah, any last questions or anything along that lines? Okay, good guys. I'm glad I, um, like I said, sometimes I am not necessarily sure if it's like, as you all watch this, is it, is it better that we just hop around and do things like this? Or is it something where you would prefer to see me start from nothing and like try to just sculpt random things or is it uh more helpful to go over some of the things that are already here and done and kind of break them down I, I, I do, I, <laughs> I do, I do stream of consciousness as well. Okay. So next time I'll have a little bit more of a, a concept. And so it's not next Monday. It's every other Monday right now. So, uh, and yeah, we, I, I can do something and then in turn, um, um, I can also print something like between the next week and we can discuss the prints and what works and doesn't work and stuff like that as well. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm assuming that, um, that should do. <laughs> and like I said, next week, uh, or next time I'll be a wee bit more prepared with, uh, something going on i now do i just end the stream do i say goodbye to everyone it's funny there's a lag so <laughs> i'm like hey, anyone All right, guys, I had a good time. And like I said, next time um, we'll uh, we'll get it uh, a little bit more uh, in stream. Awesome, guys. All right. Thanks a lot. Let's see. I have to end streaming. Oh, sure. Now I can't get it to quit. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great one. Bye.